Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start around verse 10. Paul said his whole goal is he wants to know him, that's Jesus, and the power of resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that if possible, Paul says, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's my goal, Paul says. Don't let, please let that sink in. My goal is to know him, to suffer like him, be raised from the dead from him, verse 12. But it's not that I've already achieved all this. I've not achieved all that. Am I already perfect or complete? Now, probably, you need, you, when you and I read this here, you probably, we probably need to assume that there was a group of Christians at the time period who were saying, in, in Philippi, who were saying they were complete. They were perfect in that sense. Like they, they've arrived because it's Jesus plus whatever this other gospel stuff. Paul disagrees with them. Paul dis- he said they call themselves quote-unquote perfect. So in your translation, it probably would not be a bad idea to put quotation marks around the word perfect. So when Paul says, it's not that I've obtained all this or that I'm perfect, like other people are saying that in the church, but instead I press on to make it my own. I know I haven't arrived. Paul says, I know that. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That's why I press forward. Brethren, listen, brethren, I don't consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do consider, or your translation might say, one thing about which I'm single-minded. Literally in Greek is, there's one thing I do do. That's this forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are, quote, perfect or mature, be thus minded, have the same viewpoint. And if anything you are otherwise minded, God's going to reveal you to that, that is you're wrong. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. So, we all, Paul says, need to understand, we, are, we have not arrived, and if anybody thinks otherwise, God's going to show you're wrong. Whatever growth you have had in the Lord Jesus, hold on to it. We're just not where we want to be yet. And I want to break down these, this, these couple verses this morning pretty slowly. Paul says, we won't fully know him, his suffering, his death, and resurrection until God raises me from the dead. We won't fully know him. We are a work in progress. And I wonder this morning if you have Paul's view. Or do you have the view of the other people in the church who were perfected or mature? Now, before you answer, and you go, oh, David, I know I'm not where I want to be. I know I, I'm a work in progress. Then my question is going to be, just to make him mad at me, what Christian habits do you have to make that point? Where is your proof? If you know you're not where you want to be yet, if you know that you're not fully like the Lord Jesus yet, what's your evidence that you're working toward that goal? Elaine did something phenomenal. I mean, she does a lot of things phenomenal because she's Elaine. She does. Years ago, she did triathlon, which is just, why would you want to do it? And she went, now, she, she had never done that before. It scared her to death. And I kept saying, you can do it. I'm not going to do it. You can do it. I have mild asthma, red hair. We don't like either of those things. And she did it. So what she did was she trained. She talked to people who had done triathlons. Triathlons where you swim a long time, and it depends on the length, but there's like 800 meters or something. So there's a set length you got to swim, and you got to ride a bike for so many miles, and you have to run all back to back to back to back. I think it's swim, run, bike. I think that's what it was. And, you, and it's crazy. And so she trained for that, and she would go to the pool in our bathtub. She would train in our bath. I'm just kidding. She didn't. It was a big bathtub. She would train at the pool. We knew it was about 21 laps to get the exact length. And I knew she would ride her bike a lot to get better at it. And she, of course, I mean, on and on. She would run. And she would do all this. She would get your heart rate, the whole shebang. She would check the distance. And finally, now imagine for a second, you go up there and you ask Elaine before the triathlon. And you say, how's it coming? She goes, oh, it's coming. Are you ready yet? No, no, no. I'm not where I want to be yet. But it is my goal. My goal is to get the whole triathlon just to finish it. Wonderful. What are you doing to train? She goes, huh? I mean, what are, you, are you ready? For, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's my goal. I think about it all the time. I obsess about it. I think about swimming. I think about running. You, you think about it. Have you, have you jogged at all? Have you, I mean, I think about jogging. I eat chips. I, uh, I stay up late. I don't understand. The, how can you say that's your goal? You've never done it before. 
Where's the evidence you are getting prepared for that? Where's the evidence that you acknowledge you're not there yet? So church, how's your training coming? How's your training coming? See, if you're a new Christian, you may not realize this, but I say this all the time. When I help a person come to Jesus, I said just a few days ago to Brittany, as I'm telling you, after you become a Christian, you grow up. And to grow up in the faith, as we're all growing up in the faith, you've got to do certain things. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray. You, you sing you know, praise songs. You serve. You get involved in church. You get involved in small groups. And then together we grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So the question is, how are you doing? That's not for guilt. I mean, it's just a way to say, how's it coming? Are you like Paul says, man, I know I haven't arrived. I, I love this picture. The guy's like, come on. It's that straining. I know it. And be, the evidence that I know I have not arrived is I am stinking training all the time. And here's the evidence that I realize that and I'm training. Here's my evidence in a court of law. I know I've not arrived because I got so much work to do. See, I've got mild asthma myself, and man, it is hard. And so I, if I run more than a few seconds, now it's not that bad. I haven't run a mile yet, I think, in my life. But I have to work up to do like a half mile. It takes me a long time for my just, it's a scary feeling, feeling like air. <gasps> and I mean, you have to train and train and train and train and train and train, I do, to get to that place. Now, who in the world likes to run for fun? I do not understand you people. I'm going to pray right now, God, please help me. I don't get it. I just get in a zen-like state. I just let go of the world. Like, man, I'm, I hate this. I can't stand it. I'm mad. I finished bitter. And, okay, enough of it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk about me. But we know we've not arrived, and we have training to do. So one of the instruments that I developed to try to help that for my own self, too, is in the stairwell, which I've had since I got here, is a discipleship assessment. It's just a simple piece, a couple of papers stapled together. And it asks you several questions about how's your prayer life, how's your Bible study, how's this coming? And you rate yourself 0 to 10. I use it as a mirror. You fill it out for yourself. You can just do it for yourself, just by yourself, for yourself. What I would do is I'd like to show it to someone else. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. I'll come back in a little bit. But Paul says, I've not arrived and I know it. And then he says, I do this one thing. I am absolutely single-minded. Have you ever met a single-minded person? Or if, even though the Greek is, I do this one thing. Have you ever met a person who says, I do this one thing? They just, I mean, there's going, I mean, yeah, I'm married to a person like that, David. I know exactly they won't stop talking. They're the person, like, maybe they'll talk about the vaccine. That's all they talk about when you're around them. Or how much they hate or love Trump. Or how much they hate or love, blah, blah. Or they just, when, I, uh, when I was an undergraduate, and I was just starting uh, in my, back then I was only a music major. And I was in a, started an internship under a guy who did Southern Gospel music, which is exactly what Jesus would have sung had he, had he been... I'm convinced, and the world to come. So anyway, he's singing. So uh, this man, who is a concert choir director, who kind of took me under his wing, I learned a lot from him. When he got into a group, he got into a quartet. Well, he already loved the music, but he got into a quartet, a, a really well-known quartet. He became the tenor singer. He talked about Southern Gospel. He sang Southern Gospel. He dreamt about it. He talked some more about it. He hung out with people who talked about it. I mean, I have never met such a single-minded person on that topic. And it reminds you of my cats. If I have little cats outside, I'll take have, uh, these cats. I'm turning to a cat man. I've got three cats now, adults and the kitties. And she'll take outside. You're kind of petting the cat, kind of looking around. They'll kind of look around like smelling the air. And if a cat sees a bird or a rabbit, the cat goes, Shoo! And it's amazing the laser-like focus they'll get. Just, Shoo! And, of course, being the kind person, I'll, I'll see what happens if I block their gaze. I'll put my hand in front of their eyes to see what happens. Like, I was wondering, will that break, like, when the kids are little? But they, they, all they do, the cats just move their head. Like, their head just on a gimbal. It just moves around. And then, of course, if I'm not holding them, they'll get down like they're in the, you know, the whatever. Our little kitten does that to the cat. She acts like, I'm about to, I'm about to prounce on my sister. She'll just. But the, uh, the laser-like focus, I thought, what's it like to have that kind of, your mind's attention where you're not distracted? I'm convinced that's what Paul has in mind here. I know this, Paul says, I'm not where I want to be yet with the Lord Jesus. I'm still growing up, but I do know this. I have my eyes affixed. That's where I'm headed. I'm not distracted by nonsense or sin or gossip or grudges. or un I am focused on him. I have a, I have a goal. 
Just the other day, I told my daughter, I said, some of my prayer has been for you and my son for years and years now. I really, it's a, it is a prayer that they would come to really understand that their whole lives, from morning to night, they have an umbrella job description because they're Christians, and that is to make disciples of Jesus. So when you go to school, I said this, when you go to school, one of your sub-goals is to learn and make good grades, but that's not your goal for the day. When you go to Walmart, one of your sub-goals is to get groceries and gallons of goldfish for my son, but that's not the main goal. When you go to the Verizon store, a sub-goal is to talk about phones. Every conversation, every interaction, every, every time is about one chief goal, making disciples of Jesus. Can I put a little bit of Jesus in this conversation? Can I pray for them, encourage them, their gospel? Is there somehow the kingdom of God can work through me to make them more like him? That's a single-minded person that you would see that's under the umbrella of your existence. That's why you're here. When you gave your life to Jesus, you said, I sign up for that because that's all that really matters. And then, yeah, I hope I get groceries too. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. I'm... Then Paul says, I stay single-minded, or, or I do this one thing. To do the one thing means I cannot do something else. You can't do it all. You cannot look behind. I forget the things that were behind. I forget them, and I reach forward to the goal. And see, so you and I are in the exact same boat. If we obsess about past successes, woo, I was the junk. I was so good. Like Paul did in the resume of Philippians 3, basically. If you focus on how good you were, how good you thought you were, or you focus on how bad you think you are, like Paul does in 1 Timothy 1.15, I'm the worst of sinners. I'm the, he's not the chief sinner, but it, you see the hyperbole. I know I sin. You can focus on that too. You can also focus on current struggles, all the hell that's coming at you right now, like he does in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18. Well, he talks about them, but he says, this is nothing, though glory to come will far outweigh than what I'm going through right now. If you and I focus on the past, if you and I focus on the present, if you and I focus on anything else besides what's ahead of us, we will not fully reach our goal. It's a fact. It's just a fact. I'll say it this way. You and I can get stuck in the past. Jesus is not stuck in the past. Do you understand that? Jesus is not stuck in the past. He's also not stuck in your struggles. He's not stuck. He doesn't get stuck. We get nervous and stressed. So when we pray to God, oh, Lord Jesus, help me out, he didn't listen to your prayer request and go, oh, boom, my goodness, that is kind of scary. I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me talk to someone else. What are we going to do about that? He goes, man, I'm sorry. I, I grant that you're nervous. He goes, I know you're nervous. I know you're scared. But I'm not at all. If you were to stay focused on me, you'd probably be as nervous either. I didn't say, I did not say, and Paul did not say, I never, ever think about the past. That is, it doesn't matter. No, no. Some of us have been traumatized and wounded, and we have to go to fo focus on the past. We have to get some counseling. We've got to heal. I'm a huge advocate. I've counseled people for over almost 20 years. I'm a huge advocate of focus on past wounds. That's not the point. The point here is not about not doing therapy when you need to do therapy. Paul's saying when it comes to the Lord Jesus, I, do, I forget those things. So anything that gets in the way past successes, sins I've done, or current struggles I'm in. None of that stuff is going to get in my way of my prize. None of it. See, in the ancient world, Greeks and Romans, particularly the Greek athletes, when they ran, they typically didn't run in circles. Typically, they run a straight line and backward. Straight line and backward. And usually naked. As fast as they could. And so all they have to do is run fast. Get that, and then run, just like that cat. Imagine trying to run the race that race that day, but you're in a different lane from the last time you ran a race. But you're running that race as if you're still running the past race. So you get in someone else's lane, but you don't see him. Why? Because I'm doing this. Remember that last time I was in the race? And you're running, you're bumping into everybody. People are tripping. What are you doing? You're running a different race. That race is behind you. What are you doing? Imagine for a second being married to a lane where I treat her like all my other girlfriends in the past. Call her different names. Brandon, how long do you think I would live? Not long. I mean, I've tried. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So I treat her with the same interests, the same hobbies. I call her someone else's name. How's that going to work out? 
Why were you doing that? David, what are you smoking? You can't have a relationship by focusing on the way it used to be. And you're right. It doesn't work that way. Some of you in this room, them watching online, probably are still stuck. You're stuck. You're not just wounded or grieving. You're stuck. And you are, in other words, psychological terms, you're obsessing about it. And we, all of us humans do it. We all like to focus on the way it used to be because the way it used to be feels safe. We survived it. We're still here. Those are the good old days. If I could just get back the way it used to be. And the Lord Jesus is saying, I'm not where you used to be. I'm not where you used to be. I'm trying to take you somewhere else. Whether you come kicking or screaming or not, I'm not where you used to be. I'm not stuck like you are. Please look up at me and let's go forward. That relationship you're struggling with, let me lead you to where it's supposed to go. That job you're still waiting on, let me lead you where we're going to go. Stop trying to get stuck the way it used to be. Paul says, I don't, uh uh-uh. My goal setting is I do not. I let nothing get in my way of my goal of the Lord Jesus. I want to do it his way and let him deal with the consequences. I think that's really, really good advice. It's really good advice. I press on. And then he says, of course, one more time in 15 and 16, if anyone else has a similar maturity level, agree with me. Now, whatever you've got to hold on, verse 16, hold on to what you've already attained. Hold on. So don't go backwards. If all you've got is a baby Christian, as I pray once a month, hold on to that. Don't go backwards. Go to now two prayers a month. Get to know them a little more. Just keep going forward. Verse 17, Paul says, brethren, sistren, join in imitating me. Copy me, do it my way, and mark those who so live as you as an example in us, in us. Pause it for a second. Paul saying, listen, do it my way, copy me. In fact, you Christians at Philippi, look around the room, look around your church and find other people. You also can copy and copy them. This is where people go, Paul, he's an arrogant punk. Who does he think he is? Copy me, copy me. He th- no, he's not an arrogant punk. You can think that, but that's not the point. Paul says this many times in his letters. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 that. Copy me. Now, why do that? Because that kind of is a kind of pedagogy or an educational format in the ancient world, just like we do today. If my, my wife, who's an educator for all of her life, when she's teaching little kindergartners how to write, she doesn't say, hey, whatever. She also doesn't just draw on the board and run off. She says, no, no, do it my way. Sometimes when you teach kids to have a hard time, you can put your hand on their hand and show them how to do the S. Do it this way. Now, why is it? Because there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. Paul knew for a fact that you Christians at Philippi, you Christians at Hill Church, copy, I'm doing it right. I'm in jail for being a Christian. I'm still a Christian. I'm sharing the gospel to prisoners and to the Roman soldiers, the imperial guard, praetorian guard. They're coming to Jesus because of me. And I'm not giving up the faith. Do it my way. Paul says, do the same thing. We should always emulate Christians who are going to that goal. We should always do that. Who in your world right now do you emulate? And I don't mean worship. I mean emulate. You want to be like them. Even if it's just one Christian characteristic. Maybe there's other areas they're not so much mature on. Fine. But there's something you go, but that part, I love that about them. Who is it? I can list names. I don't want to embarrass people. There are people in my life. I know people who are so gifted at hospitality. That's not a chief gift to me. I don't really like people, so they're good at... I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. They're so hospitable. Like, it's amazing. You just... It's like the, particularly females. They're like mother hens. When you're in their presence, they just... Come on, Ben, baby. My mother-in-law is that way. Just, and you just... You feel swallowed up in love. It's so amazing. I mean, it's a real gift. I mean, I, I want to be like you in that. I know people who are servants. They just, as soon as you're around them, how can I make your life better? What can I do for you? They're just certain. I'm like, man, I want to be like that. I know people who are so gifted at evangelism. It just kind of flows off the tongue. They just, like, man, I want to be like that. I'm not, that's, not, that's not me. I have to work at it. Or people who just really understand Scripture. Like, they just absorb. I look at those elements in people. Sometimes those people are dead. I read them in a book that way. Sometimes they're real live examples. Who's yours? Or think of it this way. Who's doing that to you? Well, David, I don't know. No one's ever told me. Well, that might be a sign, but maybe not. Is there anything in your Christian life that's worth emulating? 
I mean, really, they say, ooh, I want to be a prayer warrior. Who comes to mind? Linda. Oh, boy, I want to pray like Linda, prayer warrior. I want to be as forgiving as Joe. Oh, Joe can forgive. He just exudes forgiveness. I want to be hospitality. Oh, like Jill. Oh, she. What comes out of, what comes out of that? What are people looking up in you? I guarantee that if you want to stay an immature baby Christian, especially if you're not a Christian, this is does not apply to you, I guess, at all. But if you're a baby Christian, you can stay an immature Christian by not having a mentor, not letting someone disciple you. Every mature Christian I've ever known has a good disciple relationship with someone else. Someone more mature than them is saying, let me help you. And so what's a good first step? Well, you do what you want to do. I recommend to people using that discipleship assessment in the stairwell I talked about earlier, that little zero to 10 scale. I fill it out and give it to someone else and say, can you help me? Can we, can we meet sometime once, twice a month? Can you help? Let's drink coffee and show me. I mean, I want to pray better. I want to be a prayer warrior like you are. And, they, and if they're probably really good like Jesus, they're going to be very humble. They're going to say, oh, no, all shucks. Oh, no, you probably picked a good one. If that's what they do, you probably picked a good one but you seem to be praying a lot better than I do. You seem to be serving a lot more than I have, or you don't seem to hold on grudges. You seem a lot more humble than I am, because frankly, I judge people a lot, and I need to make sure I'm more like you. Open up to that and see, and that's what happens, a disciple relationship. That's, that's it. This is, the, this is Christianity in a nutshell. That's where growth happens. But what happens, what we don't do is that. We get offended, we get hurt, or we think we've arrived, and so we back up, and we don't tell people what our needs are, and we don't open up, and we, I don't want to be a bother or a chore, or maybe you think you're just all that, and we miss out on absolute maturation. Paul says to the church of Philippi, do it my way. Copy me. It's okay for us to do the same thing to other. Who do you want to copy? Who do you want to emulate? It's okay, and that's a good thing to do. Then he says, verse 18, there obviously there are people who are not imitating Paul. They are not doing it. These guys are failing at it. Verse 18, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with, he says, with grieving, with tears. He's talking about people who makes him cry. They live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul is never delighted when someone is against Christianity. It doesn't make him happy. He's not, yeah, those punks, those losers, us versus them, yeah, like everybody in modern politics, name, calling, labeling, Paul doesn't do that. Of course not, because Jesus didn't do that. Yeah, it's us versus the finger pointing. Paul says, when I think about people who are enemies of the cross, when I've shared the gospel and they're so against it, it makes me sad. I'm crying with tears. It breaks his heart. It's not a happy thing. Verse 19, he says, their end is destruction. It's not a free-for-all. God will make sure the consequences of their sins will be taken care of. Their God is their belly. Can I give a witness? Woo, woo. No. Sometimes, a literally, literally means of the belly. So it means your appetite. Certain Greco-Roman philosophers of the time period, that's how they talked um, disfavorably about people. The philosophers of the time period said, normal folk are driven by their guts and their passion. But philosophers, people who mature, they're governed by reason. So this charge is fairly common, but Paul's saying of other enemies of his, probably so-called Christians, for whatever reason, they're being driven by fleshly things. He says this by earthly things. So the point is, it's not just what they eat, but this just desirous of the earth right now, what makes me happy, just what makes me happy. And he says, that's not good. That's not good. Their minds are earthly things. But our citizenship, our commonwealth, he says, is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about that expression you've seen on bumper stickers. Have you seen it here much? It says coexist, which I always, frankly, probably some of you some of your cars right now, I always think it's pretty silly because like saying exist or breathe, like we already are, we already, we're on the planet, we already coexist. The implication probably is why can't we all just get along, stop talking about all these differences and all these religious people's calling the wars, which by the way is demonstrably false. They've done exhaustive studies on this, and under 2% of all wars in the history of the world has been accredited to religious reasons. It's not for religious reasons. So, but that's the, that's the narrative, and it fits well. Religious people call it a war. So we have to just coexist. That idea that Paul is addressing here is that some people in this time period, like today, they're focusing so much on their circumcision and things of the flesh, the now, those desires now, that they're missing out on exactly what God wants us to do. 
See, they had an idea about that in the ancient world. Philippians, if you were born to parents who were citizens of Rome, they knew they weren't really Roman citizens. Rome's way over there, and we're in Philippi. But they knew to a degree, well, we kind of are. We have citizenship in the Roman Empire, but our real citizenship is in Rome. Some philosophers even said, my citizenship is of the world, it's of the globe. Paul's appealing to that same idea and saying, our citizenship is in the heavenly realm. My value is not like here. And you and I Christians need to understand, Christians have a very different worldview and value system than the ancient world, and, and today as well. So when we go out in the world, there's no way around this. There's just no way around it. it there isn't. So we're loving, we're kind, we're all these things, but we are not like everybody else. We do not try to get ahead at all costs. We don't subterfuge other people's success. We don't call them out. We don't cuss. We don't, we don't, there's all kinds of things. We don't destroy and hurt and harm. That's not what we're supposed to do. Jesus never did those things. And so we have to choose whether, it's, whether or not we have our values based on the heavenly world or values based on this earth. And in my experience, the average person up and down the streets at the Y, Walmart, whatever, the average person is living right there for the moment. They're, quote, unquote, driven by their belly. Their passions are right near all the time. Me, 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 me. I saw a video of a, a girl who identifies as a cat. She thinks she's a cat. She feels like she's a cat. So she walks around with a collar and drinks milk out of a bowl. She has a boyfriend. They ask the boyfriend, do you understand her? She goes, oh, yeah, I understand her. She's meows the whole time. So... This is real. This kind of stuff, I mean, welcome to 2021. This happens all the time. So I, mean, I try that at home and people don't feed me any milk. I have tried. I haven't tried dog yet. But anyway, they, if you're just driven, why? If I feel like it, therefore I am obligated to, you, I have the right to get whatever I want whenever I feel like it. And I'm saying the Christian worldview, Paul agrees, that's being driven by the belly. They're in his destruction. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. Our citizenship like being in Rome, is a different place. We don't treat people like people who don't know Jesus. We don't hold grudges like people who don't know Jesus. We don't go out of our way to demonstrate our power and authority and shove it down their throat like people who don't know Jesus. We don't do that. Jesus showed us the best way. We're the way of service and of love and of sacrifice. And Paul says, our citizenship's there. Our, it's there. The last thing Paul says is to give him a lot of hope, obviously, the Savior, of the Lord Jesus Christ, comes down from there. Verse 21, he who will change our lowly body, he will change it to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. The same power, the same power that raised Lord Jesus from the dead, that he rules over all, will change our bodies. This is a fundamental common mistake I hear from the churches of all the denominations in which I have worked and all the different states in which I worked. The average Christian thinks the Christian hope is to die and go to heaven. Jesus never said that. Just read the Gospels. Jesus never said, here's how you die and go to heaven. Jesus' goal was to usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's to establish God's rule on earth as it is in heaven. So when we surrender to him, we repent of our sins, we're getting on the right side because we were rebels before them. It's not how to leave this world and go to be to heaven. It's how to be right now as if we're in a right relationship with him. Well, David, what happens when I die? Well, if I die right now, my soul leaves my body. But the end hope, the Christian hope, is that we get a brand new resurrected body. We don't wander around as little ephemeral spirit-looking things or a harp and all that stuff you see on Bugs Bunny. That's not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is we get a brand new body, a brand new body. So Jesus says it this way, for example, in Luke's gospel, Jesus says, when you host an elaborate meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's when your reward comes. And then Paul says, 1 Corinthians, now this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the blinking of an eye, the last trumpet, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. That is the Christian hope. We will get a brand new body. I stay single focus. I cannot, I do not have time to focus on all the junk back there. And one day, by the power that raised him from the dead, that rules over all the cosmos, he'll bring my body, and I'll have a brand new body. 
And it will have been worth it. It will have been worth it. 